Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Ryder here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. So for a patient who attended with bilateral fully occluding hard ear wax and keratin, I would say in the left ear, so this is the patient's left ear, he was also suffering from keratosis obturans, which I'll um, discuss and describe in more detail as the video goes on. Um, so just starting off with the left ear, and I initially inserted a, a Zollner suction probe, but the surface of the wax was just too hard. It wasn't gonna micro suction. So I immediately then reverted to a St. Bart's ear hook and I'm trying to chisel this hardened wax and dead skin at the entrance of the ear. So you, we know we're at the entrance because we can see all the cilia. The cilia are the external hairs in the ear canal and these hair follicles um, are located on the outer third of the ear canal, the cartilaginous portion, the inner two thirds of the ear canal. It's a thin layer of skin on bone. You won't find any hair strands forming uh, or, or bearing the inner two thirds of the ear canal. So I managed to chisel some of the the, the surface uh, wax um, at the entrance, and I'm now just using a, a suction probe just to see if I could elevate the wax off the back canal wall because it was stuck there, but it was still quite firm. Um, now, the patient, uh, just a bit of a background, the patient arrived, um, they travelled from Bradford, which is a couple of hour drive, um, I would say each way, so about four hours, if I'm correct, um, suffering from really bad earache. Now, they were aware that they were suffering from block tears for a while. Um, they were just a bit anxious about getting it resolved, but Obviously, the condition was worsening and they came across me in YouTube and decided to travel down to see me at my clinic in Leicester today. So we had to be very gentle. I don't, as an audiologist in the UK, we don't prescribe or use any local anaesthetic uh, like lidocaine. So our procedures are performed uh, with the patient fully awake so that we don't use any general or local anaesthetic. Um, so the patient... Uh, was was already um, in severe pain upon attending so we just had to be really really gentle and delicate with the patient and you can see I'm just gently using the ear hook to just lift the the, the wax and dead skin off the canal wall we're trying to mobilize this plug so I'm just going at the base um, inserting the hook rotating it so we can get some purchase and some grip and pulling it forwards and this was the patient's worst ear. Um, there was a hell of a lot of uh, wax and dead skin also in the right ear, so stay tuned and watch that. So I've chiseled some of this hard wax and skin, and I'm now just going back with the suction probe to vacuum some of those little pieces up. Um, because we're now entering the inner two thirds of the ear canal, the bony part, the sensitive part, I, wherever possible, just try and avoid using an ear hook or Jobson horn because if we come in contact with the bony part of the ear canal, it can be very uncomfortable for the patient. Now, this is where the patient's keratosis obturans is. So we can see a lot of dead skin here. Now, the ear canal and the outermost membrane of the eardrum is made up of a thin layer of skin, uh, which is less than 0.1 millimeters in thickness. Typically, that skin, as it dies and sheds, it should move sideways like a conveyor belt out of the ear. And the reason why our ear has developed that unique property is if you've got dead skin on your scalp, for example, or your arm, as that skin dies and sheds, it just falls into the floor. If, you're, if the skin in your ear just died and shedded and just fell inside the ear canal, then everyone's ears would be constantly full of dead skin, which should not only cause a blocked ear, but severe ear infection. So the ear has evolved over millennia so that as the skin dies and sheds, it moves sideways out of the ear like a conveyor belt. I always compare it to a snake skin. However, in patients who suffer from keratosis obturans, this skin no longer migrates, so it tries to migrate and it gets trapped uh, within the ear canal, typically quite immediately deep in the ear. And as this skin dies and sheds and it's collecting in the ear, it forms into a plug and this plug gets bigger and bigger. It expands whilst it's in the ear canal and it's got this rubber texture and it can start then compressing against the canal walls. It can cause widening and erosions of the canal walls. 
um, it can cause severe uh, deformity of the ear canal. And one of the hallmarks of keratosis of trans, uh, uh, through my own uh, anecdotal experience, is every patient who suffers from keratosis of trans suffers from um, earache. And there's four different grading systems of keratosis of trans from grade one to grade four. So grade one is the mildest form and grade four is the most severe form. So in severe, in grade four, keratosis of trans, we get significant widening and erosion of the ear canal and significant bleeding um, and also significant uh, ear pain. Uh, quite often in a grade four, the patient will need a, the keratosis obturans removed uh, via general anaesthetic whilst they're asleep because it's just too painful for that to be removed whilst they're awake. So let's slowly but surely, we're making good progress here. So we're just on the anterior canal wall. So in the left ear, the anterior canal is to the left. So the word anterior should mean to the front. So this is going towards the patient's nose. We're now on the posterior canal wall, so this is the back part of the ear canal. And you can see these layers of dead keratin that are shedded and uh, they're formed into a matrix. They call around each other. Now, I purposely didn't use drops. The patient had used drops prior. Um, there's no shortcut with keratosis obturans. Um, we were making good progress with tunneling through. Um, so I decided just to continue without using any drops. Also, when a patient's got quite a few hairs at the entrance, like this patient has, you tend to find drops if you use them, um, can smear, like it can coat these little hair strands. And as you insert the endoscope, it can smear the endoscope lens. So you're having to constantly remove the endoscope from the ear, wipe the lens. So we're probably two thirds in now. Um, so this remaining plug of wax and dead skin is lodged in the inner third where the isthmus is. So the ear canal anatomy, there's two bends. The first bend's about half a centimetre into the ear canal. The second bend is about a centimetre into the ear canal. And these bends almost form a chicane. So that meanders left and right. The ear canal then straightens after the second bend towards the eardrum and about half a centimetre away from the eardrum. We, most people have a narrowing of the ear canal in it before it protrudes back outwards. And so that creates re a recess, what creates two recesses, one inferiorly to, to the base of the ear canal and one anteriorly. And this plug of skin and wax can quite often get lodged beyond the isthmus, so it is a bit of a tug of war. So when we go this deep in the ear, I always prefer to use microsuction because again, we just want to avoid making contact with the, the bony part of the ear canal. Forceps, were, there wasn't really much for me to grab onto. Also forceps, with, with keratosis obturans, some, you can get um, keratosis obturans that's really solid, the skin, the keratin, it's really hard. This is a bit softer. Um, when it's solid and you, you gra grab onto it, it can sometimes come out in a, in a, in a big plug but when it's a bit softer to skin like this, it just, uh, the forceps acts as more scissors, really. It just cuts through the dead skin as opposed to pulling it out. You can see uh, we're just manipulating this plug of skin off the canal wall, so we're trying to mobilise it. So we're just at the roof of the ear canal here, bringing it slowly forwards out of the isthmus, the narrowing in the ear canal. I'm trying to roll it like a ball almost. And we're just giving it a little wriggle just to loosen it, free it up, and that's come out the air. I think there's a bit more in there. Yep, yeah, so there's another plug. But we're nearly done now. Now, you probably read uh, from the thumbnail. We weighed this, and you'll see um, all the contents on the scales um, at the end of the video. Whenever you remove wax and it weighs above a gram, you know it's a, a big haul. This one weighed just shy of 1.4 grams, which is, uh, I believe, the the heaviest haul of earwax I've removed. Well, I rephrase that because I'm sure I've removed heavier uh, amounts of earwax before, but I, I never used to re uh, weigh them before. So since I started weighing it, it's the heaviest. 
I think the previous one to this was about 1.2 grams. Uh, I would say about 10%, if not a bit more, um, of this the wax and dead skin in this procedure actually got suctioned up as well. So um, I would anticipate it to be obviously over 1.5 grams. So just use an ear hook to remove that last plug. Um, we've got some keratin on the anterior canal wall and we've got some on the anterior superior uh, quadrant of the ear, eardrum. It is lodged. It's very crusty there. So I'm just going to remove this skin first anteriorly. And I will remove that hardened crusted wax off the eardrum. So this pa the patient in the left ear, they had um, eustachian tube dysfunction. And in the right, they had glue ear. And... I'll explain what that is as well. So it's a good science um, almost tutorial here because we've talked about keratosis obturans, we've talked about the anatomy of the ear canal, um, we've talked about how the ear sheds the skin that lines it. So you can just see me very gently removing this off the patient's eardrum. So this eardrum is retracted, you can see that's the ha hammer bone just to the right of the suction probe and just to the right of the screen you can see um, the incus and the eardrum here it's like a uh, it's like, I think if you think about the eardrum like cling film it it's wrapped around the bone it's sucked in and we confirmed that with a pressure test called tympanometry where we measure the mobility and pressure of the middle ear so the middle ear so the cavity behind this eardrum should be full of air so it should be air filled and there's a tube called the eustachian tube which connects the middle ear to the back of the nose, to the nasopharynx. And the eustachian tube is the pressure equaliser in the ear. Because uh, we want the air pressure either side of the eardrum to be equal. When the air pressure is equal either side of the eardrum, that's when the eardrum's most mobile, and that's when we hear the best. And the eustachian tube also doubles up as a drain pipe. So any fluid that accumulates in the middle ear, it can drain out of the middle ear to the back of the nose and down the throat. Now, if this eustachian tube gets blocked, and it typically gets blocked at the back of the nose, and uh, reasons why it can get blocked, you may just be born with a anatomically narrow eustachian tube, or the muscles either side of the eustachian tube that contract, which cause it to open or weaken, or you have nasal obstruction of some sort, or inflammation or mucus. Um, if the eustachian tube is blocked at the back of the nose, there's no air behind the eardrum, it creates a vacuum. So the, the, the membrane, the eardrum, the cling film, as I described it before, gets sucked in and the eardrum can then get wrap around the bones. You can see it, it is wrapped around the hammer bone and it's onto the incus there. And that means you've got negative pressure behind the eardrum. And because the air pressure either side of the eardrum is not equal, your hearing is not optimal. Now, because the eustachian tube also doubles up as a drain pipe, fluid that would normally drain out of the middle ear begins to accumulate behind the eardrum we call that middle ear effusion and eventually that fluid if it doesn't drain it collects and it gets infected and it becomes thick and viscous like glue hence why we call it glue ear or acute otitis media with effusion and that fluid eventually will have to go somewhere because it's just filling up behind the ear and if untreated that glue ear will rupture it'll burst through the eardrum and you'll get pus and discharge coming out of the ear canal. So on the left side, glue ear is secondary to eustachian tube dysfunction. So in the left ear, on both sides, the eustachian tubes are blocked. In the left side, there's yet to be any fluid buildup behind the eardrum. But in this, the patient's right ear, they do have... Um, fluid buildup, and we confirmed that by tympanometry. So tympanometry is a pressure test. It measures measures the middle ear admittance. So how much sound it admits and allows it to transmit, conduct through the eardrum. And we actually um, assess that by measuring the middle ear impedance by how much sound is reflected off the eardrum. So we there's a special pressure test. We do a pressure sweep and we play a sound into the ear and this, uh, this device has also got a microphone so we can measure how much sound is reflected back off the eardrum at different pressures and by measuring sound, how much sound is reflected back out of the ear we can then reverse that calculation and calculate how much sound is admitted into the ear. In the left side um, 
there is sound that's being transmitted through the eardrum but at a negative pressure, which means the eustachian tube is blocked. In the right side, the eardrum is just not vibrating, it's not allowing any sound in, it's because of the fluid behind the eardrum, the sound is hitting the eardrum and it's reflecting back out of the ear. So we call that a conductive loss. Um, so in terms of treatment for the patient, uh, the patient has got a blocked nose, a sniffly today, it's a long standing issue. Um, recommended some nasal decongestion sprays over the counter. And I've also recommended the Otovent nasal balloon. So there is a technique that you can perform to equalize your air pressure. It's called the Valsalva. So a lot of pilots or scuba, dive, scuba, dive, scuba divers perform the Valsalva. They close their mouth, pinch your nose and blow into their nose whilst it's pinched shut. And that for, collects uh, air at the back of the nose, and which forces it up the eustachian tube to pop it out. Um, you do have to be careful when you perform that because if you're over aggressive, uh, although I've never come across it in clinic, but I've heard stories that patients can perforate their eardrum. So the Otovent nasal balloon is a more controlled way of performing that. It's a special balloon that you inflate using your nose as opposed to your mouth. So it comes with a nasal capsule. You attach the balloon on one end, the opposite end, you position it at the entrance of your nose and you pinch the other side of your nostril shut, close your mouth, blow into it. As the balloon inflates, it causes air to travel up the back of the nose, up the eustachian tube, it forces it open. So air can r rush up behind the eustachian tube to pop the eardrum back out. And as the eustachian tube is open, any fluid, any glue, glue ear can then also drain out. So we've advised the patient to try both nasal decongestion over the counter and also the Otovent nasal balloon. If they're still symptomatic after seven days uh, use, the patient is to contact ourselves. Uh, we'll then have to refer to see an ENT doctor who will have to examine up the nose um, and possibly uh, perform a myangrotomy where they drill a hole into the ear, suck the fluid out, and then insert a, a grommet. Uh, so grommet is a ventilation tube. It allows air to enter the middle ear via the ear canal, so the outer ear, as opposed to the back of the nose, because the eustachian tube is blocked. So, again, the patient was, was finding this procedure a bit uncomfortable, uh, and that's because this plug of wax skin, it was so hard and crusted, it was so coarse, as we're bringing it out of the ear, it was rubbing against the ear canal. Imagine, a, just imagine a stone that's larger than the, the size of your ear canal, and you're having that removed, and it's sharp. It, so another way, to, I don't know if anyone's ever had gallstones, so I've not had gallstones before, but my mom has, and I know it's it's one of the most uncomfortable things you can experience because my mom was in agony. So this gallstone, and they showed it as after the surgery, it was in it, they put it in a little tube, it was like little pellets, little pebbles, sharp, sharp pieces of stone, and that was running through your intestines, um, your gallbladder. It, it must be very uncomfortable, and you can imagine piece of stone that's larger than the ear canal in your ear as it's being removed it's rubbing against the ear canal so again just using an ear hook slowly bringing this forwards in a moment you'll be able to see the patient's eardrum it's a really hard crusted piece there So we advise the patient to attend on a yearly basis, particularly for the left side, because I, I do feel there's a bit of, uh, it's albeit grade one keratosis obtrans, but there was a plug of dead skin forming there. Um, the right side, I would say, yes, there's a higher degree of wax, but there was also a bit of keratin in there. So this plug of wax has coated the canal wall. And that's the patient's eardrum. So if you focus on the eardrum, it's a lot more inflamed, a lot more red than the patient's left eardrum. So that's the, the, the fluid, the effusion, the glue ear causing that so there is a, acute otitis media with effusion on this side and there's a bit of an attic retraction there as well so at the top part of the eardrum 
where the eardrum's a bit weaker. The eardrum's been sucked in because the eustachian tube is blocked. We can see the incus there as well, the uh, also known as the anvil, the second of the three bones. That's a stunning view of the eardrum. You can actually see a few bubbles to the left. So that's the fusion. That's all the wax um, that we collected. You can just it just looks like stones, doesn't it? If you look at that, and that's on the scales. We've collected it all up, and in a minute you'll see the weight. So it's just under one point four grams. So take care, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll speak to you soon.